Hebrews chapter 10. Let me get there. We're going to begin reading in verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Now those are the verses that we covered last week. Now let's move on. Verse 24. And... Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Now, this is where we left off. Now, Verses 24 and 25 is where we're going to begin our time with today. And as we can see in those two verses, we can see that they are connected to the previous section. Now, I purposely stopped short, excuse me, of commenting on these verses last week because I wanted to spend some time expanding on the subject matter that they introduce into the text. Starting in verse 19... And going all the way to the end of the chapter, we are given a series of practical exhortations that are based on the fact that Jesus is our high priest and we have open access to God. Now, in addition to the exhortations that we looked at last week, here in verses 24 and 25, we have another one telling us that we not only need to hold fast to the faith ourselves, We not only need to embrace the distinctives of the the new covenant ourselves, but we are to help each other do that as well. Now the recurring phrase here, let us, leads the way into verse 24. Let's look at that again. It leads the way as we are told to consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. This word here, the word consider, is actually the same verb which we found back in chapter 3, verse 1, where it was translated, fix your thoughts on. It is a strong word which means to focus attention firmly on the matter at hand. Hebrews is saying here, that we must truly endeavor to find ways to help one another to love and serve the Lord. Now, this concern to link service of God with service to one another reflects the teaching of Jesus himself. In response to a question as to the most important of all the commandments, Jesus responded by linking two commandments together. Jesus said the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind and with all your strength. And then he said, the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than these. That's Mark 12, 29 through 31. So we understand the concept there. This is a form of loving our neighbor as ourselves. Now, in verse 24, the word used here is to stimulate 
one another to love and good deeds. That word stimulate is very strong in the original. It's not passive. It actually denotes intense emotion. Incite, arouse, stir up. Those are all words that can be used to describe what Christians are being called to do here. Now, it is interesting that <clears throat> this kind of love that the author is writing about is thus a byproduct of community activity. For it is a virtue that requires others for its exercise. It's possible to practice faith and hope alone. Those are things that we have internally. I can exercise faith I can have faith in my heart. I can have hope in my heart. But love is not something that I can just keep contained inside my heart without exhibiting it, exercising it amongst other people. God is love, right? That's what John, 1 John teaches. God is love. But see, God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So love is not something that can be demonstrated in a vacuum. We can't do that on our own. We have to do it by interacting with other people. One writer said, any early Christian who attempted to live like a pious particle without the support of the community ran serious risks in an age when there was no public opinion to support him. In other words, man, oh man, do we really need each other? Now, <clears throat> the author explains the context for stimulation toward love and good works in verse 25 using contrasting expressions that mark out what the hearers the readers of this epistle, what they must not and must do. Both things are emphasized. What they must not do and what they must do. Verse 25, look at that again. Not forsaking our own assembly together. That's what they must not do. As is the habit of some, but here's what they must do. Encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So what they must not do is stop meeting together on a regular basis, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some. <clears throat> now that word assembling there is actually the translation of a common word in the Greek and it happens to be the word from which the word synagogue is derived. Of course the synagogue was the meeting place of the Jews other than the temple of Jerusalem. The word forsaking here carries the idea of abandonment. This is the word that translates <clears throat> Jesus' cry of the forsaking that he experienced from the cross when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Apparently, some in the community here were abandoning their gathering together for public worship. God would never forsake them, but some of those who had been associated with the Christian community were forsaking him and his people, missing out on the gathering. Now, in all likelihood, they may have been discouraged from Christian gatherings <clears throat> by the threat of persecution, which was causing them to reconsider maintaining continued connections with the Jewish synagogue and with the temple. <clears throat> this was of great concern. They had now become a part of the Christian community, and now because of persecution from the Jewish community, they were considering going back to that. Now, whatever the reason is, the author here sees their discontinuance of common fellowship and worship as fatal for perseverance in the faith. 
The truth is encouragement <clears throat> cannot take place, mutual encouragement cannot take place in isolation. Thus, what they must do is gather, it says, for mutual encouragement. Community encouragement and love and good works can scarcely occur if believers cease to meet with one another. Now, the fear of discrimination and persecution explains, at least in part, why some believers were inclined to abandon their meetings. If believers renounce meeting with other Christians, especially because they fear discrimination and mistreatment, they are, in effect, as we're going to see, turning against Christ. Interestingly, Jesus warned. In fact, if you want to turn there real quick, Matthew chapter 10. Go ahead and turn there. Jesus warned us in Matthew chapter 10. Beginning at verse 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. There's hardly more sobering words from the lips of our Lord than that. Then he adds, verse 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now he's not referring there to the absence of inner peace. When one receives salvation, inner peace is given. He's talking about the fact that when people embrace him as savior, He didn't come to make sure that your embracing him meant that all of your horizontal relationships were going to be okay. The truth of the matter is, to be a follower of Jesus can come at great cost. That's what he's referring to. I didn't come to bring peace in the earth. I didn't, uh, but a sword, he said. I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. For he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Basically, what he's saying here is choosing me might cost you many other relationships in your life. No question about that. Jesus said, I want you to love me more than you love your spouse, more than you love your children. And if your love for them threatens your love for me, then you're to abandon your love for them. That's essentially part of what he's saying. That's a high call. And the fact that he would add here, he, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Jesus obviously demonstrated that. So, <clears throat> getting back to Hebrews, if you want to turn back there. Apparently, some had made it a habit of not attending, not assembling. And for the author of Hebrews, this obviously is not a light matter. Forsaking such meetings actually signaled great danger. And if they did not return to the assembly of fellow believers, the result could be perilous. Now the urgency of encouragement is indicated by the nearness of the eschatological day, the last, the final day. That the day here is uh, the day of the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord was a day of judgment and salvation. 
In the New Testament, the day of the Lord or the day of Christ is correlated with the day that Jesus returns when he delivers those belonging to him and judges those who oppose him. So the encouragement is something that's to be offered because we all understand what's coming, what the future holds. And the assembly is one of the ways of keeping that information constantly before our eyes because the world wants to sap the reality of that out of our minds, drain it out of our minds, get us to be interested in other things so that we lose sight of the fact that Jesus is coming back, that the world is going to end. It's all going to burn. You've heard that expression before. It really is all going to burn. And one of the ways that we keep that information constantly on the tip of our tongues and on the edge of our minds, so to speak, is by the assembly and mutual encouragement. Now, the assembling in this context is not just hanging out with other believers informally, although that is important too. Doubtless, the reference here to assembling was the more formal manner that was already a normal part of early Christianity at this time. Now, stepping back for a moment from the historical situation that created the kind of environment that made them feel threatened to assemble, let's consider the numerous reasons why there are so many Christians today who have also forsaken the assembly for whatever reason they have. The words of this warning should ring loudly in our ears. The danger of forsaking the assembly. I want to read to you a lengthy quote. Bear with me. Tune in. One writer said this. Some have considered, in effect, that the cost of holding on to God's promises is greater than those promises are worth. They can no longer withstand their neighbor's shaming techniques and are now beginning to feel ashamed of that which once gave them confidence. Such withdrawal, however, is contrary to all sense of gratitude, which involves declaring openly one's debt to the giver and praising publicly the benefactor who has given great gifts. Listen to this. Withdrawing from the community does not merely mean that the individual falls short of God's gift. Withdrawing discourages those who remain and diminishes the group as a whole. When one's fellow believers begin to defect, it makes one wonder about the value of the enterprise and the wisdom of remaining faithful. The other believers enjoyed the same advantages and knew the same God through the same mediator. Now they decide that society's acceptance is worth more after all. On what basis should I persevere when our common experience was not sufficient to make them regard perseverance as the advantageous or self-evident course of action? Rather than draw back, they are urged to become more forthright in encouraging others to hold fast. Rather than divest, they are to invest their energies more and more. The ultimate motive adduced by the author? Question. The ultimate day draws near. As the eschatological clock ticks on, the believer should become more fervent rather than less fervent. The reference to the day drawing nearer reminds the audience, the audience yet again of the eschatological pole of their worldview. This will be a day of reward for the trusting and royal, loyal excuse me, and contemplation of its proximity sustains commitment and investment in the interim. It will also be a day of punishment for the contrary, an occasion for eternal judgment as the following passage will develop when we get to verse 26. 
There is a widespread expectation in Christian culture as well as other apocalyptic circles of Judaism of the soon approaching day of the Lord when rewards and punishments will be meted out and the new order of God's rule activated. Movement away from the group is particularly what the author wants to avoid and he urges group members to interact with one another so as to prevent this exodus. It is a bad choice precisely because it is movement away from God and one that, as the next passage will develop, actually shows cutting disregard for the beneficence of Christ which cost the mediators so dearly. The author has focused the audience attention now on the unique and unprecedented privileges that have been granted them thanks to the mediation of Jesus on their behalf. Cleansed within and without of every defilement that could make an encounter with God an occasion of fiery consumption rather than reception of favor, they have boldness to enter his very presence. And in light of this astounding benefit, the author urges the readers to draw near to God. I'm almost done. And as they continue in their confession of Christ and in the hope to which that confession bears witness, as they continue to assemble with their fellow believers and as they continue to grow in love and service toward one another, they also continue in the presence of God who hears the prayer of his household and supplies them with help now and the promise of entrance into an unshakable kingdom at the dissolution of the material creation. End quote. (laughs) Long, yes. But I love that. The idea that the writer here is desiring to stir the hearts of individuals, hey, This is something that you guys need. Now, I think that it would be, that it is wise for us to actually expand on verses 24 and 25 in order to help fortify ourselves against a number of misunderstandings that some people have about the assembly, about the church, and about its role and function in the world. And in order to do this, there's actually a number of things that I want to touch on related to the idea of church, church attendance, and what the function of the church actually is. What we're talking about here is the assembling of the body of Christ, the assembling of the church, and not forsaking that assembling, obviously, as the manner of some is. It's always been the manner of some to forsake the the local assembly of believers. But here's a a question that I, I think is a good question to ask. And that is, what is the church? What is the church? You've probably heard this statement before. The church is not a building. The church is a people. And that is actually a very quaint little saying. But I don't know if it's very helpful. Yes, the church does consist of people. But it consists of a number of people, a collection, a group of people who happen to be Christians. People who happen to be members of the body of Christ. When we refer to the church, we mean the people of God. When we say that we are going to church, what we typically mean is that we are going to the place where the body of Christ assembles. And so asking someone, how was church today? That's not a bad thing. What we mean is, how did it go in the assembly today? But... What is the church? Let me give you a textbook definition of the church. This is from Eerdman's Bible Commentary. I think it's good. It's succinct. The New Testament understands church to refer to the visible expression of the gathered followers of Jesus Christ 
who have been grafted into a community created by God under the banner of Jesus Christ, embodying an anticipatory way the life and values of the new creation. As such, the church stands in direct continuity with the historic people of God, Israel, but as an eschatological community of the last days marked off by his acknowledgement of Jesus as Lord and Messiah, end quote. That's good. It's a group of believers. It's the people who believe in Jesus Christ. It's the people of the new covenant. That's what the church is. Now in Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 through 19, in fact, you want to turn there real quick, we can look at this conversation that took place between Jesus and his disciples. And in Matthew chapter 16, these verses incorporate the historical reality of Jesus giving the name The Rock to Simon and investing it with very special significance. In the confession of Jesus as the Messiah, the son of the living God, people, Peter excuse me, and the disciples are enlightened about this church that Jesus says he is going to build. It's a fascinating conversation. When Jesus uh, <clears throat> came to the disciples and asked them, who do people say that I am? And eventually the question got back to Jesus asking the disciples in verse 15, look at that, asking them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter piped up. The one time he didn't put his foot in his mouth. Simon Peter said, <clears throat> answered, you are the Christ, <clears throat> verse 16, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood <clears throat> did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed, shall be loosed in heaven." Fantastic. <clears throat> Thus, here we see that the, the old sanctuary is going to be replaced by the new sanctuary, the Messianic community. Now, upon the death of Jesus, after the disciples saw the Lord and they were awakened out of their dismay, or they were very <clears throat> confused during that time when Jesus died and they were left to grapple with the, their thoughts and what in the world's going on and he's dead and then he appears and they're still not quite connecting with what's going on. You know, they, they have a measure of, of, of revelation, but they're still kind of foggy about what is going on. <clears throat> and so they're, they're awakened out of their dismay. And then in Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit falls upon this, this fledgling, still frightened Messianic community in Jerusalem. Remember that in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls and technically we refer to that as the birth of the church. Peter becomes, just steps right up and he becomes the instrument who furnished the word, the first sermon as to how humans may become part of the new believing community and participate in salvation that was brought by Jesus Christ. And during that time, in fact, if you want to turn there, Acts chapter 2, we're not going to read through his sermon, but just want to see the byproduct of what happened. <clears throat> when the day ended with the repentance and baptism of several thousand, it could be verified that the community of the end time, the church, had been inaugurated. The church had been birthed. Jesus announced the church and the Holy Spirit inaugurated the church. It was birthed on that day. And then there was a byproduct, something that happened. As the Spirit gave birth to the church, 
Acts chapter 2, verse 41. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. Isn't that amazing? And it says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Then it goes on to say that everybody kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they all began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone, as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now what we have here is a little snapshot. It's the genesis of the church. And it's a little snapshot. It's, it's a, the tone was being set for what was to follow, the assembly. And then throughout the rest of Acts, we see the expansion of Christianity from Jerusalem to the rest of the Roman Empire. Now, this assembling, this drawing together of the saints, this coming together of the saints, this was not a construct of man. This was not an institution if I can use that word, it was not an institution that was made up by people. This was a work of God's Spirit. Now, our Hebrews text is actually a good springboard to launch into some things, a number of things that I want us to consider about the public assembly, what we typically call the church. Since we're being told in Hebrews that we're not to forsake the assembling, what I thought it would be kind of fun to do is to take into consideration some of the misconceptions that people have about the church. I also want to take a little bit of time talking about some very bad church models because some people have a particular idea about what the church is is how it's supposed to function and they're really bad ideas and I want to talk about that just a little bit and I want to talk about what the church should be doing when it does assemble. So first of all, let's talk about some misconceptions that people have about the assembly. A misconception that people have about church. Misconception number one. Maybe you've heard this before. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You ever heard that before? You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Now, when someone says that to me, I can tell that that individual is actually very misinformed and does not understand the very basics of New Testament Christianity. Probably what most people mean by that statement is that going to church doesn't make you a Christian. I've talked with people who have taken this position and felt very secure in their belief. They believed that their relationship with God was between themselves and God and church attendance, gathering with the saints, was something that was optional. Now, it is true The church attendance is not what saves a person per se. Faith in Christ alone saves. There's no argument there. That's how a person is saved. But let me rephrase the statement and turn it into a question. Instead of saying, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, let's let's consider this question instead. Do you have to go to church to live as a Christian? And the answer to that is, Positively, yes, you do. You do have to go to church to live as a Christian. You hear the difference in the wording there. Now, our text in Hebrews equates the forsaking of the assembly with an abandonment of the faith. Fundamentally, the saints gathering together is an evidence that regeneration has taken place in the hearts. 
It shows that their lives have been transformed. One of the other evidences that demonstrates that a life has been transformed is by virtue of the fact that the Holy Spirit, when a person is born again, they develop a love for the people of God. 1 John 3.14 says that we know that we have passed out of life into death because we love the brethren. And he who does not love abides in death. What happens when a person becomes born again? They start to love the people, the other people that God has saved. That's a natural byproduct. A person who doesn't want to be around the people that God has saved, maybe they want to hang around the old crowd, that's a troubling situation, right? I'm being kind by wording it that way. <laughs> John thirteen thirty five. by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. It's one of the evidences of being born again. The common love that the saints have for one another. Paul said in Ephesians 1, 15, for this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints. That's one of the reasons when Paul was on the outside looking in and he caught word about the love that the community had for each other, Paul said, Holy Spirit's done something there. A work has been done in their hearts. Later on in this book, chapter 13, we're going to read these words. Chapter 13, verse 1. Let love of the brethren continue. That's referring to love for the saints. How could a person who claims to know God not want to assemble with the people that he has saved? So to the person who says, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, my response is normally, what do you mean by that? Is it because you, ha is it because you haven't been for a long time and you want to justify your absence from assembling? That's normally what it is. But something is fundamentally wrong with someone who believes that way. Something is skewed. So that's misconception number one. I have some more misconceptions. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up for today. We'll talk about a couple more misconceptions that people have, and then we'll look at some bad church models, and we can, <clears throat> we'll see perhaps some startling examples of what the assembly is not to look like. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> what a great message to hear right before Christmas. This is my version of a Christmas message. Hope you enjoyed it. Let's stand together. <clears throat> this is a very good text for us to park on for a time <clears throat> and to just absorb what we can out of it to consider some of the ramifications of not assembling. Now, the very specific context of, of this word is to avoid apostasy. When we talk about mutual encouragement, uh, mutual encouragement can, be, can take place in a number of ways. Sometimes it has to be done in a spirit of great warning. Brother, you are heading off the edge of a cliff. Sometimes it takes place like that. And sometimes they're not heading off the edge of a cliff. They just need an encouraging word. It happens in a number of ways. <clears throat> but we always will be sharper when the public assembly is a, a regular part of our lives. We will always be spiritually sharper when that's the case. Amen? Amen. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for making... And these words clear to us. And thank you, Lord God, that we do have the body of Christ. Thank you, Father, for the assembly. 
Thank you for the people of God. Thank you for the community of the believers. Thank you for the indwelling of the spirit that unites us together. Thank you, Lord, for the rebirth that causes the gathering together like this to mean everything to us, Lord. It is a support net that is unmatchable. The world only tries to duplicate what you do through the church and the world can't because it doesn't have the spirit. But Lord, the church has your spirit. We are the bearers of your spirit. And Lord, we want the world to know that we are your disciples by the love that we exhibit to one another. So Lord, thank you for this fresh word, Lord God, for a time such as this, Lord. And Lord, I just want to pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts that are open to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you guys.